could, grab your Bible. We're going to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter number 4. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter number 4. Uh, and we'll start, uh, really the first seven uh, verses are our, uh, our area of focus on today. But I'll just read, we'll read together the first four verses. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, so it might read just a little bit different uh, from the Bible that you have. But I promise you that we'll end up in the same place. Amen? And now if you have legs that work, if you could stand with me right quick as we read this passage of scripture. And then after that you can be seated and the next stand will be on you. Amen? First, uh, 2 Kings chapter number 4, verses 1 through 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4, verses 1 through 4. When you have it, say, I have it. I if you still look and say, wait on me. Y'all are good church. I love it. Here it is. 2 Kings chapter number 4, verses 1 through 4. It says, now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha. Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and that the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house except, let the church say it, except, a jar of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few, and you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons, and pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside what is full. Let's go back up to verse number one and just take that first phrase. Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out, cried out, to Elisha. I'd like to speak from this thought. It makes me want to holler. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It makes me want to holler. There's some people in the room who may be old enough to remember Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye, he, uh, that, that song, Makes Me Want to Holler, is a song by Marvin Gaye released as the third and final single from his 1971 landmark album, What's Going On? Anybody remember that song? What's Going On? The song depicted the, the ghettos of inner city America as it discussed how the bleak economic situation would lead to someone wanting to holler and throw one's hands up. The album, like many of that era, was not written just to make you dance, but it was penned as a social political polemic designed to identify with those who, who were victimized by struggle and gain the attention of those on the outside who needed to look inside to see what was going on. Remember, the song was released in 1971. That's about three years removed from the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The Vietnam War was being waged, substance abuse addictions and addictions were on the rise, and the poor were getting poorer while the rich were getting richer. Marvin Gaye, he looked around and saw an unjust war, he saw poverty, he saw racism, he saw marginalization and kids dying, and he saw, saw it as his duty to use his gift to sing, not just to get paid, but as a prophetic platform to produce change. Are you in the room? Right. Marvin Gaye was moved to make this social commentary because the pain of the oppressed had grieved him so much. And while he was speaking about the collective pain of the country and community, the song also applies to all of our lives. At certain points, life has the ability to make you want to holler. Is there anybody in the room? Hallelujah. Huh? understands that there are certain points in your life where the vicissitudes of life are threatening to knock you all the way out and it will make you want to holler. Whether it's sickness, divorce, a wayward child, unemployment, betrayal, heartache, the death of someone you love, or a certain catastrophe, they can all make you want to holler. And I wonder if there's anybody in the room today, any real people who have been devoted by life. Has life ever made you want to holler and throw up both your hands? Y'all will talk to me today. Has life ever made you want to holler? There are two emotions that are common to everyone in, that, in this room. One is love and the other is pain. Love and pain, regardless of your gender, your age, your race, your socioeconomic status, or any of your life's experiences, we can all identify with love and pain. We also understand that there are few things more unbearable 
you are full of anguish than when the thing or person you love is the thing that causes the pain. Are you in the room? Have you ever had somebody in your life who you love cause you pain? Any real people in the room? Have you ever devoted significant seasons of your life to somebody only to have them disappoint you? Sometimes the person you love, the thing you love, is the very one who causes you the most pain. And when your heart is broke, your head don't work, and it makes you want to holler. Let me, Jay, walk to the text right there. In verse number one, we find a woman who is in so much emotional pain and turmoil that she is hollering or crying out to the prophet Elisha. She is a woman in crisis. Her world has been rocked by the death of her husband, who incidentally was a faithful prophet. Let me pause and say that you can be faithful and on fire for God and still experience pain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can worship with the best of them and still experience pain. You can be there for people who are not there for you in your time of need and still experience pain. You can be an ideal employee or business owner and still experience pain. It rains on the just and the unjust. Hallelujah. This woman is grappling with the loss of her husband. She's distraught. She's feeling aghast. She's feeling lost. She's feeling hopeless, but she's trying to keep going. Let me give a shout out to somebody in the room who don't look like what you've been going through. Hallelujah. In fact, you've been going, a lot, going through a lot in this season, but you've been determined to keep going. Hallelujah. People mistake your smile and your gentle demeanor to, uh, to suggest that you don't have problems, but no. that your problems won't have you. Come on. Hallelujah. Give it to them and say, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Hallelujah. Keep going through the heartache. Keep going through the pain. Keep going through the disappointment. Just like the song just said, I'm all in. Hallelujah. This woman hasn't even had a chance to process the death of her husband and make it through the five stages of grief before there's a knock the door. The creditors have now come to collect the money and they are threatening to take her sons as bond servants until the debts are paid. And now the woman who was trying to hold on loses it and in desperation begins to holler out to the prophet. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing like the love of a mother. When her husband died, she determined in her mind that she was going to hold on. But when it came to her babies, that's when desperation went to a whole nother level. Because a, a real mother will fight you over her children. Any real mothers in the room? Hallelujah. Don't, don't, don't let the bundles fool you, baby. Don't let these extensions. Don't, don't, don't let it fool you. Mess with my baby and I'll snatch these earrings off. of the text so that you can respect the content of this sermon. 2 Kings 4 is a highlight reel of the ministry of Elisha, who is the prophetic, prophetic successor to Elijah, where Elijah was more of a governmental prophet who spoke to those who were in power and high positions. Elisha ministers to ordinary people. Incidentally, you should know that Elisha's name means God is salvation. <laughs> God is salvation, which not only refers to one's eternal resting place, but our God is one who will save or rescue us in seasons of trouble and hardship. You do know that he's the first real superhero. Y'all ain't ready to talk. Hallelujah. He will come when you find yourself in distress. He'll come and rescue you and save the day. I wonder if there's anybody in the room.
you? God won't ask too many questions because he already knows. And he'll come and step in right in the nick of time. And there's no place that he will not go. Y'all ain't ready to talk. So if I find myself in the club, he can come and get me there. The oil is flowing. The oil is flowing. 
give. Hallelujah. What you have left is what God is going to use. So if I were you, I would take inventory. I would begin to search through my house and try to discover what it is that you have left. Hallelujah. The devil wants you to focus on what you lost, but the glory is flowing on what you have. Yeah. Hallelujah. God is about to get glory out of your exception. Yeah, yeah. People, they talk about you and they try to diminish you by bringing up your exception. Hallelujah. Well, you know she had a baby at a young age. That's your exception. But God can use that exception. Y'all ain't ready to talk. Hallelujah. Well, you know she lost her job. Hallelujah. But they don't know that in the back room you have an exception. Y'all ain't ready to talk. Hallelujah. You know she's been a little sick. Hallelujah. But they don't understand that you still got an exception that God is still working on. Hallelujah. And he'll use your exception. Hallelujah. Study the text. Study the text and you will discover that a specific Hebrew word is used for the oil, which highlights the fact that this oil is not Crisco. <laughs> It's not lesson. It's not peanut oil. Hallelujah. But study, study the text and you'll discover. Hallelujah. I figured y'all wouldn't care what the specific Hebrew word is, and I couldn't pronounce it anyway. <laughs> but 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 what it means is the anointing. Yeah. Somebody's weird should have just hit the ball right there. But what it means is the anointing. This is this is not cooking oil. This is anointing oil. That that is oil used to beautify, to consecrate, and to set apart. It is literally a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. And the anointing is God's super on our on our natural, yeah. which equates to the supernatural. Yeah. And I come to tell you that God is about to anoint you to do what you couldn't do on your own. He's about to give you divine enablement to be able to move forward in what everybody said was impossible. Look at somebody and declare, I'm anointed. Woo! I'm anointed. He's giving me grace. Yeah. Grace. Go, borrow vessels at large for yourself, 
from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Yes, Do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons. Yes. And pour out into all these vessels. Yes. And you shall set aside what is full. I'm not offended reading the text. Because I'm like, wait a minute. This woman is hurting. This woman is desperate. This woman is on the verge of losing her kids. And she came to the man of God looking for a solution. But instead of giving her a solution, he gives her a process. Yeah. yeah. A process is a series of steps that lead to a particular outcome. What further complicates this narrative is, that, is the fact that the woman has likely heard about the mighty works of God. So she knows that if God can create a man out of nothing, if, if, if God can part a Red Sea and allow people to walk through on dry ground, if God can use a shout to bring the walls of Jericho down, if God can use a little boy with a slingshot to defeat a giant, God can instantly give her the money she needs to save her son, but God doesn't give her an instantaneous miracle. He gives her a process. He gives her a process. God, God is powerful enough and sovereign enough to snap his finger and make all of your issues disappear instantly. But his goal is not to make you happy. His goal is to make us holy. Y'all ain't ready to talk. Put another way, put another way. His priority is not our pleasure. His priority is our perfection. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't let that word perfection scare you because that word perfection doesn't mean to be flawless, as some would suppose. But instead, it's another word for maturity, yes. meaning our growth and our development. And I, and I know you wanted an answer right now, but the answer is in the process. <laughs> Glory to his name. The answer is in the process. And I'm coming to tell you. She doesn't stand there and argue with the prophet. 
The Bible says that she gets busy, her and her sons. They get busy gathering all the vessels. And they heard him clearly because he said, don't just get a few. And so she begins to gather all of these particular vessels. Hallelujah. They, they, they gather vessels from neighbors, which means you need to learn how to treat people right because you don't know when you're going to need them. Y'all ain't ready to go. And once she had some vessels gathered, she shut the door. Hallelujah. I've come to tell you that you got to shut the door on certain people because not everybody can handle the process that you're going through. Glory to his name. Quit posting your anguish on Facebook. Quit, po quit posting your disappointment on Instagram. Hallelujah. Shut the door. That means get in a secret place. Hallelujah. Hey, that's he who dwells.
to what you see now, but eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Hallelujah, I'm on my tag team partner, I'm going to put it to work, hallelujah, come on. 